reigns. He has conquered death. And he lives for us. He lives in us. Yes. Dwells among us as we abide in him. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who slept. Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. We can do that by singing together hymn number 112, Blessed Redeemer, as Pat helps us.
whole Easter story. Several people will be reading for us. First up, Hans is coming to read for us. I hope you brought your Bibles. We'll be in Mark chapter 15 and 16 throughout the hour. So please, if you didn't bring your Bible, find one in the pews and put a bookmark in Mark 15. Here comes Hans to read our first scripture lesson for us. Now we're reading from Mark 15, verse 33 to 39. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land <coughs> until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eilubi, Eilubi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled the sponge full of vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see, whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain, from top to the bottom. And when the centurion had, which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Ed. Jesus cried out with a loud voice that gave up the ghost. Do you know how unusual that is? Most of us, when we pass away, we get weaker and weaker, in and out of consciousness. Life ebbs. Our voice gets weaker and weaker. But Jesus, was in his last breath, cries out with a loud voice, what did he say? It is finished. And he passed. Just like that. So unusual. No one took his life from him. No one killed Jesus. He gave his life up. Voluntarily. For us. It was our only hope. Jesus came to earth on a mission. It began with the Incarnation. As he was nailed to the cross. He was still on mission. He was in control. His purpose for coming into our world was unfolding. No one could take his life from him. In going to the cross, Jesus took all of our sins... The sins of all people, of all times, and all our guilt and shame that goes with it. He took it upon himself voluntarily and took it to the cross and gave his life as a sacrifice for us. Now it's up to the judge. If the sacrifice is acceptable to the Father, all of our sins that we have ever committed or ever will commit, all been pardoned, forgiven. Now as Leslie's coming to the microphone to read our next Bible lesson for us, I want to welcome those uh, who are watching online, we're so glad you joined us on this Resurrection Sunday. This will be our last broadcast. Uh, we've so appreciated you worshiping with us these last two years. And we hope that next Sunday you'll come and join us here in the sanctuary to worship with us in person. If you need a ride, 
All you have to do is call. We have people standing by who will be eager to pick you up and bring you to church so that we can worship the Lord together in his house. Leslie's reading for us from Mark chapter 15. Please follow along in your Bibles. Mark chapter 15, verses 40 to 47. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph and Salome, who also, he, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. And now, when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he bought fine linen, and took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in a sepulchre, which was hewn out of a rock, and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulchre. And Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. Thank you, Leslie. We'll see you again in a couple minutes. First, we want to take a look at this passage. What I notice in this reading is that real friends are still there for you when the chips are down. When you've lost everything. When your life is in danger. You find out who your real friends are. There's a time as friends to stand up and be counted, to step forward and be there for one another. Look up with me towards Mount Calvary. Who do you see standing beneath the cross of Jesus? You probably see John, the youngest of Jesus' disciples. He's there, the scriptures tell us. But he may be the only man there beneath the cross of Christ. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, he might be there too. That's not Joseph the carpenter, Jesus' dad. This is a city councilor, an important person in town. A man that we never hear about. Yet none of the gospel writers tell us anything about Joseph until this moment. We don't know if he's at the cross or not. But when Jesus dies, when he cries out, it is finished, and gives up his life, Joseph goes immediately to Pilate to beg for the privilege of burying the body of Jesus in his own personal tomb. How long has Joseph been a disciple? Don't know. Did anybody know that he believed in Jesus? Don't know. But he stepped forward this day when nobody else did to claim the body of Christ, to honor him. He couldn't stay in the shadows any longer. And to help him was Nick. Nicodemus, the Pharisee. Remember John chapter 3? The religious leader who came to Jesus after dark, secretly, probably because he didn't want anyone else to know that he was interested in Jesus and the message of the kingdom of heaven. So he came secretly. He stepped forward now too. 
You can only be a, a closet Christian so long. A time comes where you've got to take a stand and let people know you're a friend of Jesus and take the consequences, whatever that is. So at the cross on Good Friday, there was John and maybe Joseph and Nicodemus. And verse 41 says, and many other women. Somebody tell me, how many is many? Is it three, 10, 20, 30, 50? We don't know. But there were many, many women who had followed Jesus as he ministered around Galilee, supporting him. Ministering to Jesus, ministering with Jesus, supporting him financially. And now they have come in the same caravan as Jesus down to Jerusalem for the Passover. They were there at the triumphal entry. They sat in on his teaching every day at the temple. And now they're standing beneath the cross. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus, the mother of Jesus and at least six other children. She's there. There's also Mary Magdalene. Whom Jesus delivered from evil spirits. Whom Jesus forgave of all her sins. And who therefore loved Jesus deeply. You'll never pry her away from Mount Calvary that day. The Gospels tell us there was also Mary, the mother of James Jr. Your, your translation may say James the Less or James the Younger. That was the ancient way of saying James the son of James. James Jr. So there's Mary, the mother of James Jr., and then there's the other Mary. We're not sure quite how she fits in. Some think she was the wife of Clopas, who's believed to be the brother of Jesus' dad, Joseph. So this Mary may be Jesus' aunt, this other Mary. There's a lot of Marys, aren't there? It was the most common name of all back in those days. It was the number one name to give your baby girl. And Joseph is the most popular name for boys in old New Testament times. A lot of Josephs. Or Joseph is the Greek version. Also at the cross that day there was a lady named Joanna. From a wealthy family, a financial supporter of Jesus and his disciples. Her husband worked for King Herod at the palace. And then there was Salome, who was probably Zebedee's wife. Therefore, the mother of James and John, the disciples. Some believe Salome was Mary's sister and Jesus' aunt. On top of all that, there were these many other nameless women from Galilee gathered at the foot of Mount Calvary, watching Jesus suffer. Can't believe their eyes what is happening to their Savior. My question is, where are all the men on Good Friday? Where are the disciples? Where are his best friends? The last we saw them was in the Garden of Gethsemane when Judas and the soldiers showed up to arrest Jesus and they all fled and haven't been seen since. It was only days ago, it seems, that the disciples all said in unison when they found out that Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem for Passover. They all said, 
Well, let us go also with him, that we may die with him. Didn't they say that? Where are they now? I invite you to stand with me as we sing together. A couple of verses of, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Thank you, Gloria. <coughs> Let's look at this passage together, beginning with verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James Jr. and Salome brought sweet spices. Now that's not cooking spices out of their kitchen at home. They didn't bring those with them from Galilee. Back in the days before embalming, 
it was necessary to put very strong, sweet-smelling perfumes and spices in the wrappings around the deceased body to help with the odor of decay. These were very expensive perfumes and spices. They, did, they wouldn't have brought them with them because they didn't know they'd need them when they left Galilee. They, so they didn't have any on Friday when Jesus was buried. They had to go out after that. And out of their own pocket, buy these expensive spices to anoint the body of Jesus. They brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint Jesus. Is it fair to say that these women who showed up at the tomb on Easter Sunday morning really, really loved Jesus? And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, so on Sunday morning, while the dew was still on the roses, they came to the sepulcher, or the tomb, at the rising of the sun. Now, it's Passover time. It's Easter. It's this time of year. What time did the ladies go to the tomb? What time did the sun... Anybody see the sun come up this morning? One. What time did the sun come up? And of course, back then, they didn't have daylight savings time. So it'd be an hour earlier than us. What are they doing up so early? I know, unless men work the early shift, I don't know of any men who get up that time of the morning and head out, unless their friend is picking them up to take them fishing. <laughs> or hunting. This is very early in the morning. Verse 3. And the women said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Who indeed? Who did they think was going to move that giant stone? The, the temple guards? Nah, not a chance. The disciples? Nowhere to be found. Besides that, the, the tomb has been sealed with the seal of Pilate, the governor. It is a criminal offense to break that seal, to move that stone. You would get arrested and thrown in the slammer if you move the stone. Do the ladies have a plan? Have they thought this out? No. They're not going there with a plan. They're going there because of their hearts. They're going there out of love. And love doesn't always have a plan. Verse 4. And the ladies looked, and they saw that the stone had already rolled away. Well, who did it? I'll tell you who. The chief justice in heaven looked at the sacrifice of Jesus and he's bearing the sins of all of us the chief justice in heaven said I pardon him go and let him out he's a free man he's forgiven and so he sent the angel down from heaven to roll that stone away. Verse 5. And the ladies entering into the sepulcher, brave ladies, but I guess that's what they came for, was to go into the tomb. And there they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. We only know that it was an angel because some of the other gospel writers tell us that. There was 
I guarantee you, there was no halo and there were no wings. Most of the time, when angels appear in Bible times, they appear as young men. There was nothing unusual about this young man except where he was. And the ladies were frightened. They were alarmed. They were not expecting to see anyone in the garden that morning, so early in the day. Even the temple guards guarding the tomb weren't on duty yet. They were nowhere to be seen. They sure didn't expect to see, see a living person inside the tomb. And the young men said unto them, Be not afraid. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. But he is risen. He is resurrected. He is alive again. He is not here. Behold, look at the place where his body lay. Remember, what are the ladies holding in their hands? Burial spices. They've come to anoint a dead body. What are they supposed to do with these expensive perfumes and spices now? They don't know what to make of it all. They don't know what to do next. So the young man says to them, verse 6, verse 7, Go your way and tell his disciples, and especially Peter, that Jesus goeth before you into Galilee where Jesus would spend the next 40 days with his 11. Go and tell. Go and tell. That's all. Just go and tell what you know, what you've seen, what you've experienced. In Galilee, you shall see him, just as he promised you. So the women have a job to do. They have been given a commission. They are now sent ones. They are apostles with good news to tell. Why did the angel not send a man with this message to the disciples? Because there weren't any around. Verse 8. And the ladies went out quickly, because they're scared. And they fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Have you ever been so scared you were speechless? Have you ever not known what to say? Or afraid to say anything for fear you say the wrong thing? Even women get speechless sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Norm's going to continue the story for us. Follow along. As Norm reads for us, Mark chapter 16, beginning verse 9. 9 to 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 was risen early the first day of the week. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that uh, been with him, that they mourned and, and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and he had seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and the drink any deadly thing, they shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So that after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up in heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. Let's look at this. Verse 9. Now when Jesus was risen early, first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. What a privilege to be the first to meet the risen Christ. Can you imagine? Why Mary? I'll tell you why Mary. Because the other women were so afraid, so confused, so lost. They, they didn't know what to do. But Mary Magdalene, she went back and told the disciples what they had found at the tomb. They didn't believe her. So Peter and John ran to the tomb to see for themselves, and Mary Magdalene went with them. And they checked out the tomb, and sure enough, Mary was right. His body was gone. Peter and John didn't know what to make of it either. Had his body been stolen? They didn't know. So they headed back home. But Mary didn't leave the tomb. She couldn't. She didn't know where to go or what to do. But she wasn't ready to give up. She wasn't ready to walk away. The last place she had seen Jesus was here at the tomb. And when you lose something, or you lose track of somebody, what's the best thing to do? Go back to the last place you saw them and try to pick up their trail. So that's what Mary's doing. She's hanging around the garden tomb trying to figure out Trying to make sense of it all. Verse 10. And she went and, and told those who had been with Jesus. In other words, the eleven. As they were mourning and weeping. Even though they've been told by, the, by Mary that the tomb is empty. That, that the young man said he had risen. They are so deep in their grief and their loss. And the disciples, when they heard that Jesus was alive and had been seen by Mary, they believed not. Why? Because it was a woman who told them? No, I don't think that was it. I think they are so lost in their grief that this would be too good to be true. They're afraid to believe it. They don't want to get their hopes up. I mean, if I told you that your favorite uncle, who passed away years ago, that I had seen him this week downtown, would you believe me? Ah, not unless you saw him yourself. That's where the disciples are at. They haven't seen him, so they don't believe. Twelve. After that, Jesus appeared in another form unto two of the disciples. Not necessarily the two of the twelve, but two of the many followers of Jesus as they walked and went into the country. We read about in the other Gospels 
the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, on Easter Sunday evening, one of them lived there. His name was Cleopas. Who the other disciple is, we're not told. Some think it was his wife. Some think it was Peter. Others think it was Nathaniel or maybe Luke. We don't know. But Jesus caught up to them on the road. And he, was, he appeared in another form. That's an interesting phrase. He appeared in another form. I don't think that means he came after the resurrection. He was a different creature. He didn't appear as an animal or as an alien. Because I, I think it was more likely that he appeared in a different outfit than he had worn in the garden when he met Mary. There, he, the attire he was wearing gave her the impression he might be the gardener. And it wasn't until she, he spoke her name and she looked up into his face and immediately she knew it was Jesus. On the road to Emmaus, the disciples are so discouraged. They're so down in the dumps. I think all they see is the gravel on the road. But when they sit at their home and Jesus breaks the bread and prays, something he says causes them to look up and they see his face and they know immediately it's Jesus. I don't know, maybe he was dressed more like a scribe or a tax collector that day. I don't know. But when they looked in his eyes, they knew it was him. 13. And those two disciples went back to Jerusalem and told their story unto the rest of the disciples. Where did they find the disciples? Behind closed doors. And they told them what had happened to them on the road, how they had met Jesus. But neither did the disciples believe those guys. <coughs> Faith in what we haven't seen is hard. Faith in what we haven't personally experienced is so difficult. The disciples were really struggling with this one. You and I probably would have too. Verse 14. But afterwards, Jesus appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat with the doors locked. And he upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not those who had seen him after he was risen. How many times in the New Testament does Jesus say to his disciples, O oh, ye of little faith, why do you not believe, even though I tell you, but unless you see it for yourself? It's hard to believe in that which we do not see. Jesus said, blessed are you who have not seen and yet you believe. You are blessed. You will be blessed. But when I think about it, when we hear that the Lord has miraculously cured a friend of cancer, Don't we sometimes think in the back of our head, well, let's just wait and see what the doctor says. Don't we? Or, or, or if we hear of some celebrity who's been born again, a, a little voice says to us, well, let's just wait and see. Let's give him some time. See if it's real or not. Or if we hear about revival breaking out somewhere. But we haven't seen it. We haven't been part of it. We get skeptical. Well, we'll see. Let's see what fruit comes out of it. We're a skeptical bunch if we haven't seen or experienced for ourselves. That's what's happening here in Jerusalem. Verse 15. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye to all the world, 
and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Is believing important? You think? It seems to be. And these signs shall follow them that believe. He's speaking here to his disciples. He's about to send them out as apostles with the good news of the kingdom of God to spread it to all the corners of the globe. The signs he lists here have to do with those who go forth as missionaries, as apostles, in obedience to the Great Commission. He says, you watch for these signs. Number one, in my name they shall cast out devils. Does every missionary cast out de demons? No. But among those who take the gospel to the four winds, to the lost, there will be those who have to deal with demons. A missionary friend in Malawi says that almost every time they have an altar service at church, they're dealing with at least one demon. Almost every altar service in darkest Africa. But a re report more recently from someone ministering in England, he says in Europe, it's happening now, more and more and more. As the Christian faith is being washed away from Europe, more and more they're having to deal with demons in their ministry. Can we to be too far behind? No. Number one, they shall cast out deep devils. Number two, they shall speak with new tongues. Will all missionaries speak with new tongues? No. But many will have to. If they want to reach the lost. Number three. They shall take up serpents. Now. He's, Jesus is not talking about those churches in the hills of Kentucky. <laughs> where they keep a cage of snakes at the front of the church. And each Sunday. Those who wish may come and prove that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the sign of being filled with the Spirit is that you will not be scared to pick up a rattlesnake and play with it in church. That's not what Jesus was talking about. And I do not feel called to go be the pastor there. I've met many people who said, I, I could never be a missionary in the jungles of the Amazon or Congo or Bangladesh because of all the creepy crawly things they have there. When I was on a mission trip in the Dominican Republic some years ago, it was a construction team. We were building at a, a youth camp. And we were warned on the first day, be very, very alert when handling any of the construction materials, the cinder blocks or the two by fours that have been sitting there for some time. They said, for any one of those could have a great big black spider or a scorpion, maybe a tarantula or a snake. Be very on your toes. Anytime you pick up anything, you probably want to wear gloves. And I've known people who would not go on mission trips or become a missionary because of that fear. Jesus says, when you're going for me to spread the gospel in the jungles, don't worry about the spiders or the snakes. 
I will be with you. And I will cover you. I will protect you when you're on my mission. Don't be afraid. Number four. And if they drink any, any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. On that trip to the Dominican, one of our team members brought an extra suitcase. I mean, it was a big suitcase. It was like this by this. Great big one. Full of nothing but bottled water and jars of peanut butter. Because he feared that he would, not, would get sick from drinking the local water. And afraid he couldn't stomach the native food. And he wasn't going to go hungry or thirsty on the mission field. And I know many who said, you know, I think I could be a missionary if it wasn't for the food or the polluted water. I don't think I can do that. Jesus has a promise for them. Even if you get the wrong water, if you're on mission for me, if you're taking the good news to the ends of the earth, you don't have to worry about it. I will be your healer. I will be your protector. I will shield you from what would otherwise make you sick. And number five, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Will every follower of Jesus be able to pray for people and see them healed every time? No. But many do. Especially those who go out with the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. I hear reports all the time of miraculous healings, even resurrections. For the raising of the dead. By the laid on hands of the missionary. Jesus wants these men to know. That as they go forth with the good news. In obedience to the great commission. He will be with them. He will be their power. Their help. Their strength. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them. He was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Mission accomplished. It is finished. The sun is back in heaven where he belongs. The Easter story is not complete until Jesus is sitting on the throne of our world once again. Resurrection is not just coming back to life like Lazarus did. It is rising to eternal life, to reign with the Father in glory. Now it is finished. This morning I want to thank God for the women of faith who gave generously to the work of Christ who ministered unto Jesus right to the bitter end, who watched over his body when it seemed like all had been lost, who went looking for his body when it went missing, those women who believed in the resurrection and who gathered in the upper room to wait and pray with the apostles until they all received the gift that Jesus had promised, the Holy Spirit of God. And I want to thank God this morning for the apostles who, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, turned the world upside down with preaching about Jesus, the crucified one, the risen Messiah. Were you there when they crucified our Lord? No. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? No. Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Of course not. Yet we believe. Why? Because a faithful group of women went with Jesus to Jerusalem. Went with him through the trial. Witnessed his suffering and his death. 
Even as his dead body was wrapped up and placed in a cold, dark tomb, they were there. If those dear ladies had not gone to anoint the body of our Savior with spices that Easter Sunday morning, we might never have known the whole story. We might still not know. If Mary Magdalene had not been faithful and obedient, if she had not gone and told the eleven disciples about the empty tomb, would the men ever have believed? Would the disciples ever have come out of hiding? Would they have ever seen the empty tomb for themselves? I personally thank the Lord for faithful women of faith who led the way. Like the two lady evangelists who started this congregation back in 1905. Where would we be today if not for them? Or like my Sunday school teachers when I was a child. Every one of them, a woman, teaching me about Jesus and about salvation by faith alone. Where would I be? I thank God for godly women who have walked with Jesus all the way, all their lives, who persevered with Jesus to the very end, and who prayed for my salvation. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to pay the price for my debts. Thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to pay the ultimate price for our forgiveness, our salvation, our eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for those faithful women who trusted Christ and who celebrated his resurrection. And thank you, Lord, for those apostles who, when they saw you for themselves and had the opportunity to reach out and touch you. Thank you for giving them faith to believe in the resurrected Christ and for anointing them with the Holy Spirit and sending the good news to the farthest corners of Canada that we also might believe in the one who lives forever who lives and reigns above. Lord, anoint us today as we celebrate this holy day. Anoint us to go and live for you and to spread the good news without fear that Jesus Christ is alive and is coming again. We worship you. We give you praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name.